So what is our reference point? It's the scripture. Everybody say scripture. Listen to this. Listen to what the Encyclopedia of Biblical Word says about the scripture. It says, only because God has shared his evaluation of good in his word are we who rely on him able to affirm with confidence that a certain thing, quality, or course of action is beneficial. It's all about the scripture. Can I talk about the scripture for just a few minutes? Everybody say the scripture. 66 books in the Bible, right? 66 books written over 1,500 years. I mean, would you go back 1,500 years? If you go back 1,500 years, you're at 516 AD. Do you understand the British Empire hadn't even been thought of? You're only 200 years after Constantine of Rome. That's a long time ago. 66 books written over 1,500 years by over 40 writers from three different continents in three different languages. Many of these writers didn't even live in the same generation. And many of them didn't even know what the other guy wrote. You put it all together after 1,500 years and you get this perfectly harmonized book called The Bible. Come on, what are the chances of that? I mean, that's like going back to 516 AD, say to a guy, write a chapter, then go 100 years, 616. Say to another guy, write another chapter and do this over 1,500 years and put it together and tell me you got a book that makes any sense. But then to make matters even more amazing, more amazing, if you look at the Old Testament, everybody say Old Testament, 39 books written over 1,100 years with the last book of the Old Testament written 400 years before Jesus was even born, would you go back 400 years? You have no cowboys. I mean, you don't even have United States. I mean, the pilgrims just got on the boat, for goodness sakes. That's a long time. The last book of the, is written 400 years before Jesus comes along. And you know what these Old Testament writers did? Many of them lived in different generations, don't even know what the other guy said. They made predictions about the coming Messiah, predictions like he'd be born in Bethlehem. He'd be called out of Egypt. He'd ride in Jerusalem on a donkey. He'd be betrayed by a friend. He'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That 30 pieces of silver would buy a potter's field. He'd be crucified. He'd be buried in a brand new tomb. There's 300 of these predictions that these guys made in all these different books. Do you know Jesus came along and fulfilled every single one of those 300 predictions? Amen. What are the chances? So there's this scientist that lived in the 20th century. His name is Dr. Peter Stoner. He was an expert in probability. Do you know what probability is? Simple probability. If I got a five-gallon paint bucket and I got nine white tennis balls, one yellow tennis ball, I shake the whole thing up, I blindfold somebody, say, pick one ball out, the chance of picking out the one yellow tennis ball is one in ten. That's simple probability. Well, this guy's an expert. But he doesn't do the research alone. He employs 600 science students from 12 different classes. They go on a massive research of what is the probability of any human being fulfilling these prophecies. A third party, the National American Scientific Council, reviewed their findings and said not only was it accurate, it was conservative. So what I'm about to share with you is conservative. So Dr. Stoner and his 600 science students said, what are the chances that any human being from the time of Christ to the end of the second millennium, 2,000 years, could fulfill eight of these prophecies? What are the eight that they chose? Number one, Christ to be born in Bethlehem. Micah writes that. Number two, Christ to be preceded by a messenger, Malachi and Isaiah in a different generations write that. Christ to enter Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah in a totally different generation writes that. Christ to be betrayed by a friend, the psalmist in a completely different generation writes that. And then here's the other eight. So they, they did hours of calculations. What are the chances that any human being could fulfill these on earth over 2,000 years? And this is the answer. You ready? The chances are one in 10 to the 17th power. You say, what's... 10 to the 17th. That is a one with 17 zeros behind it. Does anybody even know what that number is? It's not bazillion, kajillion. I got news for you, okay? I don't even know it, but I can illustrate it. If I have that many silver dollars, I have no place to store them on earth. I just got to spread them out across the ground. If I have that many silver dollars, I will cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. Now, gather all those silver dollars. Mark one of them redistribute them over the entire state of Texas two feet deep, blindfold a guy in Oklahoma, put him on a helicopter, start flying over Texas. At any point, he can say, let down. He gets out of the helicopter, still blindfolded, picks one silver dollar. The chances of picking out that one silver dollar that's marked is the chances that any human being over 2,000 years could have fulfilled eight of those prophecies that Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. That's where you clap. <laughs> So Dr. Stoner and his scientists said, what about, what about 16 prophecies? So they do hours and hours of calculation. Remember, this is conservative. You know what the chances of any human being over 2,000 years fulfilling 16 is? Here it is. 
1 and 10 to the 45th. That's a one with 45 zeros behind it. If I have that many silver dollars, I can't store them on the earth. I got to just make a big ball of silver dollars. You know how big that sphere of silver dollars would be? The diameter of that sphere would be 60 times the distance of the earth to the sun. If you want mileage, 5.5 billion miles. Now, mark one of those silver dollars, shuffle them all up, blindfold the guy, put him on a jet plane. It would take 400 years to fly around that ball nonstop on a jet plane. At any point in time, he can stay let down. He's still blindfolded. He might have to dig to the center because the mark one might be at the center, so he might have to dig 2.75 billion miles blindfolded. The chances of picking out our one mark silver dollar is the chances that any human being could have fulfilled 16 of those prophecies, yet Jesus fulfilled all 16. Can I blow your mind? Can I blow your mind? Dr. Stoner and his 600 scientists said, what, well, what about 48 prophecies? So they took 48. After hours of calculations, this is what they determined. Remember, this is conservative. Chance of any human being fulfilling is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. <laughs> now, I can't illustrate that with a silver dollar. It's too big. I got to go to a smaller item. I got to go down to an electron. Do you know how small an electron is? If I have a one inch straight line of electrons and I start counting them right now, okay, and I count 250 per minute and I don't go to sleep, it will take me 19 million years to count that one inch line of electrons. Now, if I have that many electrons, I got to make a big ball of electrons, solid ball. You know how big that ball would be? It would be, the radius of it would be as far as man has ever seen into space with the Hubble telescope. 13 billion light years. Now mark one of those electrons. <laughs> Blindfold a guy, put him in Cape Canaveral, send him up in a space shuttle. At any point in time, he can say stop. He gets out blindfolded. Picks out one electron. Chance of picking out that one marked electron. It's the chance that any human being could have fulfilled 48 of those prophecies. Yet Jesus not only fulfilled the 48, he fulfilled all 300. <laughs> now, can I review what I've just said? Okay, you've got 39 books that contain over 300 pro predictions, prophecies. Last one's written 400 years before Jesus comes. They're written by many different writers who lived in different generations, don't even know what the other guy wrote. And Jesus comes along and fulfills all 300. And you tell me the Bible doesn't apply to today. You're stupid. <laughs> this is why the writer of Hebrews says this. Hebrews chapter 12, or Hebrews chapter 2. I want you to look at these words. This is written to Christians. We must, not we should, we must. Look at the word must. Listen, not just carefully, very carefully to the truth we've heard, or we may drift away from it. You know, drifting doesn't happen consciously. It happens unconsciously. When I was a boy, I loved fishing. I remember one time I was in my boat, and I forgot to anchor. I was so excited about fishing. And I'm fishing away, and 30 minutes later, I look up, I don't even recognize the shoreline. I drifted so far from where I started. And I didn't even know it, because drifting doesn't happen knowingly. See, can I ask you a question? If somebody said you have to cross a landmine field, 10 miles long, 10 miles wide, there's thousands of landmines buried, you step on one of them, you're dead. They give you a map that shows you where every landmine is. How do you handle the map? You just throw it in your backpack and say, God, gosh, i got to make this journey. If i got time, I'll read it. Do you kind of just glance at it and say, I got it, put your backpack and go? You do either of those, they carry you out in a body bag. I'm going to tell you what you do. You study that thing like crazy, and then you put it in a place easier to reach in your water bottle, and you pull it out constantly making reference. Well, let me tell you something. We're walking across a landmine field, and that's why the Word of God tells us, Thy Word is lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. Amen. You know, I had, <clears throat> I had three international leaders look at me. These are highly respected men. Three different occasions. So John Bevere, I mean, I've written 19 books. They're in 93 languages. They're pushing 10 million copies. And I remember they said to me, this is the most important message God has given you the body of Christ to date. And I remember, and I've only got chapter one out to you, okay? And I remember I went to prayer after the third guy. And I said, okay, God, why is this message so important? And the Holy Spirit said this so, so clearly to me. He said, it's a calibration message. I thought, calibration, calibrate a machine, you get accurate readings. But I, I thought, I got I to gotta research some more, this more. So I found out in my research, because I have a scientific background, calibration is most frequently used. Now listen carefully to me. It's most frequently used 
in regard to gas detectors that are put in chemical factories. Our federal law requires every room in a chemical factory to have a gas detector in it because a little toxicity in the air can damage a person, their employees for life, or kill people. So I found out the number one manufacturer is Honeywell. And I went to Honeywell's website. And I went to the page that tells me how to calibrate their gas detectors. And when I get to that page, you know what it said in bold letters on top? We strongly recommend as the manufacturer that you calibrate these gas detectors every day. And they give the reason. Because the atmosphere will corrupt the sensors eventually. So you know how they calibrate them. I'm going to simplify it. They take these machines down, bring them into a clean air room, clean off the sensors, re-zero out the machine, put it back out so they know they're going to get accurate readings. So let me tell you something. Our heart is our sensor. We live in a corrupt environment. It's called the world, right? Every day we should be going into a clean air environment. It's called the Word of God and the presence of God. What does that do? It washes us. It cleans our sensor so that we go back out into the world. We're not conformed to it. But we prove, you see, it's not a formula. What is good and perfect and acceptable will of God for our lives? Let me tell you something. Calibration is so important. Why? Because we're the only Jesus the world's ever going to see. And if we're uncalibrated, it'd be kind of like trying to reach a radio station that's 88.9, but you're at 90.1. You're never going to hear it. You're never going to see it. You're never going to experience it. And the other real reason calibration is so important it's because it's all about intimacy with God. I don't know about you, but the most important, and I think I do know about you. I know enough to know if you are a Christian, the number one thing you desire from God is intimacy. We want to know his heart. We want to know his desires. And when you're out of calibration, you again, just like a wrong radio station, can't pick up what he's saying. That's why so many are frustrated. We're out of calibration. That's why we want it. We want intimacy with God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I preach what you've commanded me to preach. Thank you for helping me. If you're sitting in here today and you'd say, you know, John, truth be told, God just really spoke to me. I, I feel like I am out of calibration. I just want you to put your hands up high because I want to pray for you this morning. Just put them up really high. Wow, look at all the hands. I love your honesty. That's why you're such a great church. Just put them up high. Don't be ashamed. Now, can all of us, I'm about, 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 40% of the people, maybe 30% raise their hands. Just put your hands back down. Can all of us pray this with those 30%? Say this to me, God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Lord, I'm asking today that my heart would be calibrated correctly with your word. It begins by declaring Jesus to be my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. My life is yours. As I open your word, reveal to me your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.